The other thing that is done in modern systems, and this is for people that are quite paranoid, but fairly cheap, at least it was initially motivated by cheapness, is what's called redundant arrays of inexpensive disks. At least that's what it was called in the original paper. The companies that actually started to sell these a few years later didn't like having inexpensive in their marking materials, so they usually call it independent instead. And the way that works, and this, this was the case, this is from the paper that introduced RAID. They were looking at the cost of disks, and the cost of a big, fancy, expensive, huge disk with something like 7,000 megabytes, that's like a whole 7.5 gigabytes, this was costing you about $18 per megabyte. You can multiply 18 by 7,000, so that's $100,000 or so. So that, that was something that if you were really cool, you could buy and you could afford one of these. Whereas the cheaper disks, the cost per megabyte was starting to get much cheaper. If you were a company that wanted to store a lot of data securely, or at least reliably, you're much better off buying a whole bunch of these. Actually, uh, sorry, this is not the disk. This is the cheap disk. This is the ratio between the two. So you get better price per value, and it's not that bigger, it's more of a factor of two kind of difference. Buying smaller, cheaper disks, the cost per megabyte is much lower. So what you want is some way to use those smaller disks to get what you would out of the big disk. And the way to do that is to put a bunch of them together. So this is where the redundant arrays of independent disks or inexpensive disks comes together. You can structure it like this. If you've got a mainframe with a controller, you're going to hook up multiple disks to that controller. Or on more like a PC, you're going to connect more than one disk to a bus. Once you start thinking about what you get from multiple independent disks, you've got to figure out how do you actually put your data on those. You could use it just like one big disk. You could say, you're going to think of it like one big disk. You're going to use the first disk until you fill up. And then you're going to move things in the second disk. And then you're going to, move things, you're going to fill up all those disks just like it was one really big disk divided into four pieces. Are there better things we can do with our four independent disks than just stick them together like that? If we want to read a file quickly, Let's say it's a really big file. Do we want it all on one disk, or do we want it split onto the four disks? Yeah, so maybe we can split it up on four disks. So instead of having to do reads and wait for one long read, we can do those four reads simultaneously. For that to work well, we've got to figure out where to put the blocks and how to coordinate the disks, because if the seek time is still the main time, this could be slower if we have to wait for the longest seek time. But if we can do something smart there, this is going to be better. What's the other thing we can do if we have four disks that are now inexpensive? And what was the first R for? Actually, there's only one R. What was the first letter in RAID for? Yeah, redundant. So we can use one disk for redundancy, or we could use more than one. And there are different ways of doing RAID. There are several different versions of RAID that were evaluated in that paper where you can figure out how you use redundancy on the disks. You could do something real simple, let's say, keep two copies of everything on two pairs of disks, or you could keep four copies on one. What RAID level three does is on the fourth disk, so there are four disks, on the fourth one, you keep something that will enable you to recover from a failure on any one of the other three. What can you keep that will allow you to recover from a failure on any one of the other three? What do you store on the fourth disk? Yes. It checks them. OK. Um, well, so we said a checksum is one way, that we can't really go back from a checksum, at least a, a checksum if it's done like that SHA hash that's used in ZFS is very much one way. We can't go back. It's on the right track, though. Yeah, what do we want? Yeah, XOR is our magic function that is much simpler than a checksum and is easily inverted. So if this is equal to the XOR of these three. If any one of those three fails, so let's say disk one fails. So if disk two fails, we don't have this anymore. How can we restore disk three? So now we bought a new inexpensive disk. We want to write into that new disk all the values that were previously stored on the one that failed. How do we produce them? Yes. 
Yeah, exactly. So to produce those values, well, we have this value. If we XOR that with A1, which we can still read, and A2, that's going to give us A3, and we can restore that disk. The XOR is tolerant to failure of any one of the other three. It's also tolerant to fail failure of disk 4, because we can recompute the XORs. So as long as we don't have two disks fail at once, then we're OK. The different RAID levels do different trade-offs as far as how much space you're wasting and how robust you are to different kinds of errors. But this is a pretty good option in the design space.